Okay, uh, we will start the webinar series. Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm TM Ram, uh, my name is TS Ramesh Sababadi. I'm the moderator for this session. Uh, I would like to welcome all participants for this webinar series number five, jointly organized by UPM and myself. Before we proceed with the webinar by Mr. Chin, the title for today's webinar is Surveillance and Investigation as Function of Quality Assurance in Aviation Engineering. Okay. Uh, there are a few house rules that I have to uh, say before we start the webinar. Uh, please, uh, please, uh, audience, please mute your microphone. If you're not uh, talking, uh, let uh, Mr. Chin do the presentation first. The Q&A session will be held at the end of the session. Uh, once Mr. Chin has finished his, uh, his presentation, you can either ask questions uh, via uh, online or you can even type in the chat box. I can read the, I can read the questions. Uh, we have still participants are still uh, coming in, uh, joining in. Uh, we will just continue our series. Okay, uh, but then uh, let me introduce uh, Mr. Chin. Okay, Mr. Chin, uh, sorry, uh, Chin, uh, his full name is Mr. Chin Ken Xiang. He actually started his career with Malaysia Airlines as trainee aircraft engineer in 1989. In 1993, he became a licensed aircraft engineer. In September 2000, he was a quality assurance inspector then being promoted to senior quality assurance engineer in September 2007. And he became the quality assurance superintendent at September 2011. And moving forward, he went for a greener pasture. He left Malaysia Airlines system and he joined Airbus. He was with Airbus from September 2015 as a manager embodiment operations development and he moved himself up as a manager, FHS logistic operation in June 2017. And to move his career path, he had moved forward to head of quality and safety in January 2018 at Sepang Aircraft Engineering. Mr. Chin has got a was, uh, we, are, we actually fondly call him Mr. Chin. Eh? Uh, we uh, we fondly call Mr. Chin. He has got a very vast experience in maintenance and also in quality assurance. Uh, I would uh, welcome Mr. Chin. Uh, you are ready to give your presentation? Uh, yes, I'm ready. I'm okay. ready. Can you hear me? Uh, you're clean. So you are clear to give your presentation, Mr. Chin. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Yes, Ramesh. Uh, thank you, uh, Prof. Professor, uh, for organizing this. Uh, let me start by giving a short uh, welcoming. Yang uh, berhormat Tan Sri Tan Sri Datuk Sri Datuk Datuk Tuan Tuan Puan Puan. Terima kasih untuk yang dihormati sekalian. Terima kasih untuk mengundang saya uh, ke webinar pada hari ini. Tolong izinkan saya bertutur dalam bahasa Inggeris. Okay. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for spending your time. Uh, this morning uh, for this uh, presentation. Uh, I would like to uh, just uh, say a few things. If I tend to speak a bit fast, so I'll try to slow down uh, what I say. If I'm talking a bit too fast, please stop me via the chat or uh, just uh, unmute your microphone and uh, just let me know. Okay. Is the uh, presentation running on your side? Uh, no, Mr. Chin. It is uh, on the front page itself. It's on the poster itself. Okay. Yeah, give me a moment. I don't know why it's frozen. Okay, it's good now. Okay. All right. Uh, today's presentation, uh, we this is the introduction to the presentation. We are divided into uh, three parts mainly, but I'll start off with an introduction. 
the introduction will be a bit about myself and uh, some other information that you require. Uh, since the target audience for this particular webinar is actually the original intent was for non-aviation staff for uh, UPM students and uh, mindset. So I have uh, particularly made it a bit simple uh, for non-aviation staff to understand. But however, uh, for those who are in the aviation industry, you can ask me questions. Uh, if I can answer, I will, of course, share my views on that particular matter. Okay, so you start off with the introduction. Number two is the part one, the definition, documentation, references, and the organization. So I will run through some definitions here in this particular part uh, in terms of uh, some of the definitions we use in quality and some minor documents, a uh, few documents uh, which I made my references from and the organizations, a typical organization within uh, aviation maintenance organization, uh, which uh, we are, uh, we formally, formally call a CAMO or AMO. Of course, there are more than two, but we, I will just stick to these two uh, just for the ease of this presentation. Uh, if I once I've established part one, uh, the background of the uh, uh, the definitions and the requirements, I will go to part two, which are the process of uh, surveillance investigation and of course its challenges. Then I will complete it with part three, uh, of course the invest investigators' traits, background and qualification, and I will end with question and answers. Okay, let's start. From the beginning, very basic. I have a disclaimer. So this disclaimer, uh, basically, uh, this presentation is a general information and experience shared by to the target audience. So the following presentation is purely for knowledge purposes. So it does not negate any current requirements laid down by the regulators or the industry or even uh, even my set. So it's purely based on um, is for education purposes. Okay, here's my career path. So I will not discuss whatever's on the left side of the panel uh, for the benefit of uh, MySet and UPM. Uh, I will concentrate on the first item uh, on the right side of the panel, which is the Credentials Civil Aviation Authority of Malaysia. A lot of uh, non-aviation people actually uh, ask this question, what is this uh, AMEL license? So I will briefly touch on this and uh, Basically, it's a uh, it's a license issued by the Civil Aviation Authority of Malaysia, which comes in at least which comes in four categories: category A, category B1, B2, and Cat C. So I have the B2 category, and of course the Cat C with certain type ratings uh, issued on the license. This allows me to uh, exercise my privileges as a licensed aircraft maintenance engineer uh, within the scope of the CAA in Malaysia. Okay, and uh, of course I have some uh, other qualifications. Uh, this was actually mainly to enhance my career path into the uh, corporate uh, corporate ladder. And of course I'm also a member of uh, BEM, MBOT, and uh, IEM. Okay, let's begin the definitions. We'll, we'll give, I'll give you some definitions first. Definitions, uh, okay, surveillance. There's three definitions in this slide. Uh, surveillance. Normally people, uh, mainly the general public, including myself, uh, tie surveillance to the police. I think in Malay it's called uh, pengawasan. Uh, but surveillance is, uh, you cannot uh, generally tie surveillance into the police only or in terms of audits or in quality. Even uh, researchers actually do surveillance but they term it differently maybe participation observation. But mainly surveillance, the, the definition is a close watch kept on someone or something, close observation, especially to prevent a non-conformance. Okay, next, we have investigation. Then what's the difference between investigation and surveillance? The action of investigating something or someone, formal systematic examination or research. Basically, we drill down to a particular subject that we need to find information on. Quality assurance. ISO 9000, if you go to one of the paragraphs in ISO 9000, it gives this uh, open quote, uh, close quote, 
part of a quality management uh, system focused on providing confidence that the quality requirements will be fulfilled. And there's another definition right at the bottom that the maintenance of a desired level of quality in a service or product, especially by means of attending to every stage of the process of delivery or production. Okay, the next, the next point I need to uh, highlight, quality versus compliance. What's the difference? Uh, in Malaysia, uh, at least in the aviation maintenance organization, uh, the term quality or quality assurance or quality control has been used uh, all the time. In fact, all the time, not most of the time, all the time. But there are certain countries out of Malaysia, had, uh, uh, especially in Europe, they have started to use the term compliance within the quality group. Um, so, so now the definition I wrote here, quality and compliance are both crucial components of maintenance, engineering, and manufacturing process. But there's a big difference between the two. Quality is defined as a product or services that's delivered in, to the intended performance, while compliance is a defined as meeting regu regulatory requirements. Meaning that if you comply with all the regulations that is set up in the law of the land, it doesn't mean that you have a quality product. You may comply with all the rules they have set out, but you may be inefficient. So quality, uh, in terms of compliance to quality per se, you are actually complying to technical specifications and technical requirements on top of the regulation. Okay. Okay, the next slide investigations versus audits. There are questions uh, posed that uh, are investigations audits or audits a subset of investigations. So I've made a table here uh, to tell uh, the, some salient points within the difference between the two. Um, there are some similarities. Uh, some of them are very similar in fact in terms of our techniques and in terms of uh, uh, communication, uh, but I'll run through one by one. First item, investigations, they are mainly ad hoc requirements. You do not plan investigations. If you plan investigations, it means there's something really wrong with the organization. As opposed to audits, they are mainly scheduled. So you have a uh, schedule plan, audit schedule plan for the year, maybe for a particular area, for a particular month. So you have time to inform the head of department of that particular area. So we have a schedule for audits. Uh, second item, in-depth verification and examination of an ex incident or an accident event versus for audits verification of a system-wide tool catch deviations in processes. Okay, this means that uh, if you think of a funnel for investigation, you have the top of the funnel, which is a very broad surface, and you try to funnel down your facts and information to a particular point in time or a particular area. But for audits, what you do is a, it's a very macro view of the particular processes or organization. You, from A to Z of the organization, you tend to uh, audit or look into all the processes, which whether any the processes are followed or not. Okay, item three, an investigation can be performed after an audit had been completed. Audit may form for under audits, audit may form the basis for an investigation. So very seldom you have investigations, completing an investigation, you have an audit, very rare unless uh, maybe one of the findings within the uh, investigation had indicated that an audit has not been done in the area. But generally, it's the other way around. When you do an audit, it will, may warrant an investigation. Item four, factors leading to the event and fraud detection. 
Okay, this is self-explanatory. Uh, fraud detection within audits are mainly how uh, how shall I say they are more finance in in nature. You know, in in quality in terms of engineering processes, we don't normally detect fraud, but we uh, detect non-compliance and uh, non-conformance. Uh, item five: identify gaps within the processes and way of work. Understand the problem. For audits, audits is done in compliance to procedures and regulations. So between the, these two statements in item five, you can see audits are more, uh, it has a wider scope in terms of a, a review of its processes. But for investigation, you tend to funnel it down to a particular point where you find the root cause of the event. Event can be an incident or an accident. Uh, I, will try to, I would like to use the term event because um, the term accident or incident sounds very uh, drastic. And the last item, for investigations, there is no fixed duration. The investigation can go on for months, weeks, or even years. But for audits, there is a duration. There is a fixed duration. Normally, it's a week, sometimes a day. Uh, if it's a very wide scope uh, audit, it can go up to a month, especially financial audits. Okay, these are the uh, reference documents which I had, uh, which I had uh, picked up. Uh, the we will start off from the top here. Civil Aviation Act, nineteen sixty nine, with the two thousand fifteen and two thousand seventeen amendments. Then it goes down to the Civil Aviation Regulation, twenty sixteen, and evidence notices and evidence guide. So in terms of importance, it goes this direction. Okay, uh, why I'm making this document reference? Not because I want to have a pause on uh, air legislation, but in terms of uh, for non-aviation people, he, they, I would like to highlight uh, in the coming slides why, why the quality department is hold such importance within the organization. Uh, if you look at uh, even the Civil Aviation Act, it doesn't mean that you need to have a quality department. It doesn't say directly, but it somehow it gets translated from this down towards the organization. Uh, gentlemen, uh, my screen is frozen again. Uh, just give me a minute. Okay, uh, while Mr. Chief uh, is going through his, uh, his presentation, basically, Mr. Chin, while you're looking at uh, these four documents, one, two, three, four documents, uh, some sort of like a Bible, is it? Uh, it, I, I don't like to use the word Bible, but it's something that, uh, how, how should I say, uh, in Malay, they call it punca kuasa. Where does your empowerment come from? When you have a organization SOP, who empowers the SOP? There must be a higher level document. And if you go to the next higher level document, who empowers that particular document? So it has a hierarchy of... Uh, uh, authority in terms of regulation and of course uh, manuals. So, for example, uh, in my last one of my last uh, organizations I work for, you have a uh, first level document, second level document within uh, the organization. The first level documents are mainly approved by the Civil Aviation Authority or the National Aviation Authority. Then where does the National Aviation Authority get its power from to empower to approve these documents, they must get it from somewhere. So you go to a higher level document, so which is the C Civil Aviation Regulation, which is approved by the, written and approved by the minister. So where does the minister get the power to write the regulation? He gets it from the act. act. So the source of empowerment, where does it come from? Okay. Okay, uh, the following slide, quality department in an AMO. 
AMO is Aviation Maintenance Organization, as the title says, uh, Aviation Maintenance Organization. AMO. Uh, for the non-aviation participants here, we normally call this the part uh, 145. Uh, don't worry about all this terminology, 145 club, just don't worry about it. Uh, just imagine there are two structures that I'm going to present. These are typical structures. They are not structures within any organization, but most of the organizations will follow this structure. Similar, something similar. A var variation of it or a total difference, but the basic principles are the same. The, the quality department will report to the accountable manager. You see right on top of the uh, organization, there's accountable manager. The accountable manager can be the managing director or a general manager. As long as he meets certain requirements set out by the regulation, he can be the accountable manager. Mainly he needs to have some corporate authority in terms of finances, uh, approving finances, uh, he must know, he must have an understanding of the regulations. Then, of course, uh, the quality department will report directly to the accountable manager. Okay, this one is the AMO. This is a typical structure of a CAMO. It is the same principle. The quality department or the quality manager will report directly to the accountable manager. Why is this? We will see later. Uh, when I say report directly, it doesn't mean that only the quality manager reports directly to the accountable manager. You got other areas like a uh, maintenance manager, line maintenance manager, workshop. It may be, or you can combine these roles into one one person reporting directly to the accountable manager. As long as you have a discussion and it doesn't contravene any regulation uh, with the law of the land, it may be done with some discussion. We may, um, I wouldn't say with some, with many discussions, I say, with uh, the National Aviation Authority. Okay, quality assurance department personnel. This is a typical two-man setup. You have the first item, quality manager. He's normally, he is the post holder and the administrator of the department. Depending on the size of your organization, uh, it may be, a uh, one man or two man show. Um, generally speaking, you have a quality assurance inspector or engineer uh, reporting to the quality manager. The quality manager in, in term varies from organization to organization. Some may call it head of quality, some call it manager quality assurance, some call it director of quality. But in the eyes of Civil Aviation Authority Malaysia, he is the quality manager. He needs to go through an assessment uh, when he's uh, as a post holder, and when he gets accepted by the Civil Aviation Authority of Malaysia, he will be the post holder for that particular organization. Of course, uh, to be the quality manager, ideally not a must. Okay, maybe not a must is a wrong term, but ideally he he should have worked as a quality assurance inspector or engineer with the following job functions. He must have done some audits, uh, may, may have written some procedures. They do aircraft type assessments for licensed aircraft engineers. Surveillance and investigation is part of the function. And uh, the quality department is the focal point for National Aviation Authority. Uh, they report, uh, they do occurrence reporting, ISDR, uh, ISDR is an uh, in-service difficulty reporting. And of course, uh, in certain cases, they also do evidence review or SB reviews. Uh, for the third last one from the bottom, uh, why I put National Aviation Authority, NAA, as opposed to the Civil Aviation Authority of Malaysia is because the Civil Aviation Authority of Malaysia is the NAA. And uh, especially for um, some uh, AMOs, maintenance organization, they have multiple NAA approvals, uh, maybe from not only from Malaysia, they're from EASA, from Singapore, from Thailand, from Indonesia. So we term them National Aviation Authority. Okay, for the benefit of uh, UPM and MISET, uh, these two particular organization, for this one, uh, 
the best example I can give is this is the operator of the aircraft. And basically you, you drive the car, uh, you must do certain maintenance, you are, you are responsible for the maintenance. And this particular one, uh, maintenance organization is your car workshop. So where you send your car for servicing, maintenance and all that, this is a very, very layman term explanation, example which I can think of at the moment. Okay, why surveillance and investigation? Why not audits alone? I have uh, this red bar, here, horizontal red bar here. Uh, okay, this red bar represents the financial year of any organization. Uh, the financial year can be January to December or Jan most of the time it's January to December for in terms of at least in quality or it could be from uh, February to the next January. So within this financial year, there may be one or two milestones in terms of scheduled audits. Let's call these milestones half yearly audit for the first one and full cycle audit for the next one uh, for a particular area. So you have scheduled audits uh, at least twice a year in a particular area of the organization or a section within the organization. Then that gets translated into the audit plan. Within the audit plan, they have multiple locations for this plan audit. Okay, fine. Works perfectly. But what happens if they have a situation in this point in time in the first half of the year, which is called event one, and another situation and that point of time in the second half of the year, which I term event two. So this is where surveillance and investigations come in. These are all ad hoc, uh, ad hoc situations. Event one may or may not be an incident or an accident, but uh, it could be just a surveillance that you found a non-conformance while uh, the quality assurance engineer does his walk uh, in the hangar floor or in a workshop. Okay, so, so surveillance and investigation function uh, complements the audit function within the quality and uh, processes. Okay, that concludes the part one. Uh, basically, if you have questions on part one, do write it down or send it to within the chat chat box or inform uh, the mo our moderator. Um, what I'm trying to uh, establish within within the uh, part one of it is that your source of empowerment for the quality department, where does it come from? So it comes from uh, regulation documents and of course, organization structure. Why is this important? You'll see in the next part. Why, uh, why do I stress punca kuasa? Malay, punca kuasa. Why do I stress that point? You will see. Okay, uh, shall we start part two, Ramesh? Yes, okay. Uh, all right. Uh, so far, uh, okay, uh, the participants, do you have any questions on part one? The participants, uh, if you all got any questions on part one, you all can ask uh, because you might forget at the end of the day, which is part one, part two. Right. So if you all got any question that you all want to ask, uh, basically I can see most of the participants are also some from uh, QA uh, and also uh, airline staff. So if anybody got any question to ask in part one, you all can uh, proceed. Uh, if no means, we will start on part two. Uh, just uh, one question. Um, we had got to the camo and maintenance workshop, right? Can, can it be the same organization? Thank you. Uh, could you uh, repeat the question? I didn't catch the question. Okay, uh, Mr. Chin, um, can the camo and maintenance workshop, you've shown the two slides on the uh, uh, organization, right? Uh, camo and maintenance mm -hmm. workshop, can, can it be the same organization? Is there any conflict? Thank you. Uh, you're talking about uh, camo and AMO. Uh, yeah, basically, whether they can be the same person or not. 
Uh, can they have the same accountable manager for Kamo and also for Part One Four Five? Okay, I, I think this uh, in everything uh, else in uh, the regulation, the regulation has very clear guidelines within uh, the one four five and part M itself. So the part M will say one thing uh, on the accountable manager, and another also says accountable manager in one four five. I have seen uh, I have seen cases which they are together. I have seen, uh, but the best is this question is you need to post it to your uh, PMI. And you need to uh, study your structure itself, whether there's any conflict within the structure itself or not. It shouldn't be a conflict. Basically, somebody needs to be responsible for M and somebody needs to be responsible for 145. Okay, Mr. Chi, there's one question posted in the, uh, in the uh, chat box here. Is there any differences between uh, CAA Malaysia ISGR versus FAA SGR? Uh, okay. Uh, the, actually, the, the, the ISDR is basically a term used by Civil Aviation Malaysia for occurrence reporting. Uh, previously, if the uh, if uh, some of us are old enough, we use the term MOR. The um, uh, mandatory occurrence report uh, basically was a generic form that uh, we should use for aircraft on operations and of course incident that happens within engineering itself. So what they have done is that in ISDR, they have separate, separated out for uh, occurrence reporting within uh, the uh, airworthiness portion of it. So, so, so it's basically a uh, maintenance reporting form. But it doesn't mean that you can't use it. But it's a, if you look at it, it's a, basically a maintenance reporting form. So for the FAA, for the FAA, I'm not, to be honest, uh, this FAA form, I'm not seeing it. Uh, but I do believe that, that they operate in a similar fashion as the uh, SDR. Okay, uh, anybody has got any uh, further questions uh, before we uh, move on to the uh, part two? Uh, there's no question in the chat box. I think, uh, Mr. Chin, I think we can move on to part two. Okay, okay, I'll, I'll finish part two and three, then I'll take the questions later. Okay, sure. Okay, surve okay surveillance. Okay, this is uh, some of the uh, key points in surveillance maintain a presence in the work area, act as an advisor to the frontline staff. Okay, we uh, gone are the days where we should think well, the quality department is the policeman of the organization. It shouldn't be because so we should be working together, uh, quality the, and the frontline staff should be working together for the particular goal of the organization. So, so advisor meaning that it doesn't mean that you know you tell you to, to hold your hand to tell you what to do, but to point you to the right direction. Okay. The next point to pick up non-conformers at any time. There may be a schedule for the quality staff to do their rounds in the hangar, uh, Ronda Anna. Could they could be, uh, but uh, it is only uh, manpower allocated for the particular area for the week, but it. But the, the allocation uh, in terms of the surveillance, uh, the quality engineer can do their surveillance at any time. Information gathered through observations. Normally, we don't, uh, we don't go and interview people. Uh, we just observe as see if any non-compliance. After observation, then we do some interviews and uh, request uh, the staff to see, you know, well, well, why are you doing it this way? Why? Are you doing it that way? It is not Big Brother watching you, so it's not like you know you don't you shouldn't have this fear of uh, there's somebody looking over your shoulder uh, in terms of surveillance. More often than not, the whole week of your working week uh, in the organization may pass without having uh, anybody walking the the hangar floor. Ideally, it should be someone, but it may happen in such a way. So, so. Do not worry about uh, anybody observing you all the time. 
Okay, investigation techniques and uh, I this technique uh, basically is divided into uh, three major steps. You can see the the light colored box, uh, which has the title collection of data uh, and data analysis and presentation of findings. Um, then of course within the the three boxes, it has been broken down to step one, step two, step three, step four, five and six. Bear in mind, this is technical investigation. It's not criminal or anything. This is technical investigation. Do not, uh, do not, do not. Uh, you may use the principle for some other uh, purposes, but we are discuss discussing technical investigations only. Uh, okay, uh, occurrence, uh, incident, accident, depending whether it's major or minor, will trigger an investigation. Okay, the following slides, what I'll do is that I will explain uh, each individual steps uh, and run through it. I will run through a general detail, but I will run through the techniques involved because it will take too much time. Okay, first step, collection of data, immediate action. What do you do? Uh, establish the following, location of incident. I, uh, second one, details of an aircraft, there's a grammatical error there, the details of the aircraft, such as a registration, what type is it, whether, what the certificates it holds, or where the, where is the aircraft, is it in a hangar or in an apron? Details of the incident, general details. Uh, more, more often than not, if you start the uh, investigations immediately, you cannot uh, have the full picture. So we try to get some brief description of the incident. And of course, uh, is there any personnel involved? Then you need to establish whether there is there any immediate danger to lives uh, post incident. Uh, whether the, after the incident or accident, does it affect aircraft or airport operations? Uh, uh, let's say if the, uh, you have a tire burst and the aircraft is in the taxiway while towing, you need to inform the tower that uh, you have an obstruction on the particular taxiway. And then you need to quarantine the aircraft records. Depending how major it is, uh, we quarantine the records. If it's uh, during a uh, maintenance check, you can uh, suspend the check and quarantine the records also. The uh, discretion is on the investigator. Or, or rather, uh, you need to assess whether the incident uh, warrants it or not, whether it's major or minor. And of course, you need to do occurrence reporting, occurrence reporting to authorities, OEM, and the insurers as applicable. Okay. Uh, most of the time, we will report, do a occurrence reporting to the authorities. Then we will follow up with the investigation report uh, in terms of incident. Okay, step two. Establish the scope of investigation. Uh, first item. This is under plan the investigation. So now uh, when I talk about the part one in terms of uh, empowerment, uh, where the source of your empowerment comes from. Why? Because you need to establish your scope. Uh, when you, If you do an investigation, they will ask you who had empowered you or who had asked you to come and do this investigation. Uh, are you the right person to do the investigation? So you must know your scope. And within the investigation, you must know uh, uh, the your boundaries of your uh, your requirement of the scope. You do not uh, go on a tangent in terms of investigating everything under the sun. Well, you need to focus on a particular area only. Okay, investigation team. Who leads the team? In general, if the incident or accident happens within engineering, uh, it, will, it will stay within engineering unless it involves other parties. So the quality team within the engineering will investigate. But let's say if it, it's an uh, incident or accident involving, um, for example, maybe airport operations or flight operations, then uh, we, engineering, if it involves engineering, we will form part of the uh, team. Generally speaking, engineering do not lead such investigation teams if it's out of engineering. You need to establish what are the resources you have. Uh, do you need one investigator, two investigators? Yeah. 
if you need to go to the remote site, how are you going to get to the remote site? Uh, what is the time frame you have? So resources can mean uh, whatever means available to you. What you need to complete the investigation, it can be time, it can be finances, it can be transportation, it can be manpower. So it doesn't mean it's only money. Time to incident accident site. This is crucial. You ideally, ideally to to have uh, a clear understanding of the incident or accident, you need to get to the uh, incident site as fast as possible. Uh, try not to wait. Uh, get hold of your witnesses or or the people you intend to interview quick. Uh, of course, you you when you when I say get to the incident site as quick as possible. Uh, make sure that uh, the initial uh, incident has uh, has stabilized first. Uh, you try to uh, eliminate all the dangers that uh, they may pose uh, that have caused the accident or incident. You 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 make sure the site is clear for an investigation. But time is important. You need to get to the place quick. Uh, it's easy if it's in the hangar. Your office is upstairs on the first floor. You just can walk down. So that's easy, but uh, let's say if the incident is in a remote site, then uh, you need to assess uh, whether you need to get there or not. Um, most investigation team team has an on-site investigation kit. Make sure you bring along your kit. Your kit could include a camera, measuring tapes, ruler, markers, plastic bags. Uh, if it's a simple investigation, you may not need to bring everything. Just need your camera or your tape, measuring tape. And of course, you need to identify the personnel involved. If the quality department had uh, issued an authorization to that particular LAE, it may warrant a suspension of the authorization uh, while the investigation is, in, uh, is undergoing. Okay, this will be step three, uh, data collection. What sort of data do we take? Mainly, we take written statements, uh, eyewitness interviews, uh, eyewitness statements. Then we check personnel authorization, proficiency training, and uh, employment records. Uh, see whether is there a background to this particular uh, trend of uh, incident. Of course, maintenance records of the aeroplane. What was being done? What was or is or had been done to the aircraft? Site visits. Site visits. Uh, you need to uh, go to the site and establish a sequence of events how the uh, incident happened uh, physical inspection of the components and uh, the last point uh, sequence of events and timeline this is very important establishing timeline uh, any investigator uh, would know if he's trained in investigation that uh, i would say more than 50 percent of the time uh, they can more or less assess what really happened through timelines. Uh, timelines are important also to assess whether the uh, person that you're doing interviewing uh, uh, has any uh, factual discrepancies in their statement. Uh, that if uh, it, it will be even easier if it involves two or three persons. Timeline will establish, establish a lot of that. Uh, especially the police, when you have been for any police interviews, they always uh, uh, try to establish timelines. Okay, continuing to data collection, then you need to look at the technical manuals and current procedures, whether they're current or not. They do not use outdated manuals. Uh, this is uh, quite an easy thing to look at, you know, when you, if you have a master list or especially now that everything is in electronic, um, uh, most of the time, uh, it is the printout that is uh, not up to date, not so much of the, uh, the information available in the server or, or online. Then uh, approved serviceable tooling available or not available. You need to know whether the, they have the tooling or not, or whether the tooling available today, is it calibrated? Uh, or has the calibration expired? So these are the things that you, the tooling that uh, you need to look into. Or you may have the tooling. You may be calibrated, but the tooling is damaged. 
So these are the small points uh, we tend to look for. Uh, the next item, DFDR, SS, CVR, and Mini QAR. This one normally we will download if uh, the, uh, I would say, if the incident uh, warrants uh, some sort of uh, investigation on term, in terms of how the aircraft had behaved. Uh, let's say if there is an incident, a uh, runway uh, excursion of the aircraft, we tend to quarantine a DFDR and SSCVR. Uh, but but uh, with technology nowadays, the mini QAR can give you the data as required uh, as recorded by the DFDR. Uh, next item, OEM involve and involvement and feedback. Uh, you may need to inform the OEM in terms of the incident. Uh, there may be some uh, uh, component issue or maybe there might be some trends on the particular incident that may have involved a particular system or uh, maybe the engine. So it's a good thing to uh, get the OEM involvement. They will give you their feedback. It, it may take some time, but they will give you their feedback. Of course, uh, data collection also involves the environment, what you need to establish, whether what is the weather of the day. Uh, if you're working in a hangar, what are the hangar conditions? Uh, what are the lighting conditions? Uh, this will affect your maintenance tasks for your staff working. So if they're working under duress due to environmental issues, uh, then you can establish, you need to establish the, uh, the conditions. Uh, to supplement your witness statements and your witness uh, accounts interviews, uh, if your organization or your facility is equipped with CCTVs, then it's a very good tool to, to download the particular footage if it's available. Sometimes the CCTV might be available by pointing in the opposite direction. So it's a good thing to check if you have the CCTV footage or not. And of course, organization uh, conditions. This could be your work culture, uh, your, your, the way we do things. So they will affect uh, your maintenance uh, processes. Of course, human factor, if you're in the airline business, uh, no, if uh, the human factor is a big topic. For the benefit of uh, uh, non aviation staff, human factor is a study of uh, uh, humans uh, making errors. Why do they make errors? And uh, the, uh, the main uh, grandfather of uh, human factor is always Professor James Reason, which they, he came up with the Swiss cheese model. So there's a different, uh, a total different discussion altogether. It will take some time. So uh, this is a brief uh, description on human factors. Final note. A technical investigation is to find causes to the event, it's not supposed to apportion blame to any party. This is very important. Okay. Step four, you already collected your data. What do you do with your data? You need to analyze your data. So what's the first thing you need to analyze your data? You need to revisit your scope of investigation. Make sure, because when you, when you collect data, you've been collecting so many things and even some of the data you've never seen before, so you 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 have dug up. So you need to go back to your original scope. Why are you doing this investigation? Why are you trying to? What are you trying to find? Then from there you filter out the all the noise. The noise meaning you have uh, collected so much data which is irrelevant. Try to eliminate that. Revisit your scope of investigation. Uh, review forensic evidence and facts. This is a very big statement, uh, but it simply means that. Uh, if you have few samples, few fluid samples or hydraulic fluid samples, you send to the lab and check whether there's contamination or even if you have a MCD, whether any metal particles within the uh, engine MCDs or not. So that's forensic evidence. Of course, uh, you need to, the third item, you need to establish sequence of events and action of the crew. From your interviews and your timelines, it's good that you chart it on a big board from this time to this time on this date, uh, who said what, what has happened and uh, for maybe uh, witness A. And then of course you go to witness B, then he does this and see whether they have any alignment or not in the story. Uh, 
if you find a gap, then you can always revisit the witness or having factual evidence that covers that particular gap. Uh, okay. Uh, fourth item, non-conformance to technical procedures, SOPs and regulations. You need to establish whether there's any uh, non-compliance to the lay down procedures. You're supposed to do A to Z, but he doesn't do, he does 1, 2, 3. So you need to find out whether there's such a non-conformance. Uh, any future, any any human factor involvement? Yes. Uh, you need to find out whether the person is sick when he came to work. Uh, he's uh, working alone. He has no buddy with him. You need you, uh, then, of course, uh, the next item: organizational factors again. And meta maintenance error decision A. This. This is a tool uh, created by Boeing. I had used this tool before. Uh, it is a very good tool to establish whether, if through your interviews, if you use this tool, you would know that whether what sort of error has been done. So through the process of elimination through this, this particular tool, you can go to uh, item one, two, three, four. Finally, it will give you a particular, at the end of the session, it will give you a, more or less a grouping of uh, error of reasons behind the error but this tool has its limitation uh, once it's not an error you can't use this tool you have to abandon this uh, this tool and of course the, when you when you analyze the data collected the last point do not employ only single factor only event mindset because all of us including myself initially when we started uh, investigation we are looking for the silver bullet that is the only thing that caused the event. It is, through my experience, it's not. There are multiple uh, factors that will cause the event. Some are significant, some not so significant. So try to have this mindset that there's no silver bullet. There's no silver bullet in terms of the particular fact that has caused the event. Okay, presentation of findings. Uh, you have step five, corrective action. This step uh, may or may not be done. It depends on the situation. Uh, if you, through the course of your investigation, you find that there's an urgent need for corrective action, you need to inform the, the management to correct it immediately. Normally, corrective actions are done through audits. Uh, if you find through your investigations, uh, depending on the, uh, the level of severity, uh, the corrective action needs to be done now, then you do step five inform everyone that these are the recommendations required for the corrective action. But more importantly, after analyzing your uh, data, you need to formalize your data within a uh, formal report. So you use, you formalize your presentation. Uh, your presentation will, uh, into, this for, uh, into this official report, uh, will be read by the accountable manager and his peers. Okay. So, item three, findings and non-conformance to details to link, needs to be linked to a reference. Through your course or your investigation, if you find, you have findings, you have causal, uh, causal facts, you need to link it to something. You cannot just have, uh, you have this finding, but you don't have a particular reference to it. If you don't have, there could be only two possibilities. It can be an observation or it could be a recommendation. So when you have a finding which is linked to a reference like a MM or MOE, non-compliance non to let's say this para in the MM, you are on very strong footing, very strong footing in terms of that particular finding. Okay, your conclusions must be based on evidence and fact. It cannot be anything else. Okay, then of course you have, you need to put in, in your report, observations, recommendations, if any. And the last point, amendment to the preliminary report. Uh, sometimes when you do an investigation, maybe it's a investigation that is of interest to everyone. You may need to come up with a preliminary report during the first few days of the investigation. A preliminary report uh, will be amended once you complete uh, the final report. So the this may or may not happen. The last line, you may or may not have a preliminary report. 
it depends on the severity of the incident okay so i have one highlighted uh, statement in yellow there no conspiracy theories we are not in a business of conspiracy theories here whatever we find what will we conclude we summarize must be based on evidence and facts okay uh, investigation challenges uh, what are our challenges Yes, this list is not the final list. It's not exhaustive. There are many more which at the moment I can't think of. Uh, but uh, it goes on. Limited resources available. Time frame and manpower. You may need more manpower to interview people. You may need more time. Uh, the next thing is that uh, available procedures are silent on carrying out maintenance steps. So now what do you decide when you, you had observed a particular procedure but this procedure or this uh, task done is not mentioned anywhere uh, is it a finding or not so you need to decide you need to decide that's where making reference or informing the oem is very important okay information feedback time from other parties such as oem you may inform the oem of such a such a non-compliance or incident but they may not come back to you uh in the soonest time they may take their own time to come back unless you indicate to them it's urgent even that also the OEM needs to uh needs to find their own uh, do their own research before they can actually give you a proper reply so that all that takes time item four uncooperative witness uh this is not really a main problem because sometimes uh staff get traumatized after the incident you do not once a person is traumatized you do not go in straight and uh, and uh, give an interview you will never get a very accurate uh, description of the event if you do that so you, uh, uh, the soft skills within the investigator uh, needs to come out in terms of when to interview when not to interview so uncooperative witness doesn't mean that he is trying to hide things here it's just that he could be traumatized by the event okay item five interference from other parties this means that uh, let's say you have a very high profile investigation and an investigator had been assigned to the particular case or investigation everybody wants to know everybody wants to have the first uh, piece of information to gossip so you get the investigator will be undulated with all sorts of calls and questions from other people unrelated to the particular event so this uh, this is one of the challenge where the investigator got to be strong to, f to to say no to everyone and concentrate on his work uh, item six deep latent organization work culture present uh, the the last example which uh, this is the way we do things and we've been doing it for the last 30 years cannot change so so, uh, so uh, the investigation may find a roadblock in such such a manner and of course when you complete the report there are uh, other parties not agreeing to your report findings um, that is why in the previous slide i said you must base your findings uh, base it on evidence and facts and of course a reference to the finding then you will be on a very solid ground then other parties cannot disagree with you last point of course unions if you are you need to be aware if the organization is union unionized or not so you, the person that you're interviewing may need a uh, union representation so make sure you get the union representation <laughs> into the interview uh, room do not go on uh, interviewing the person uh, without this representation so you must know whether your organization uh, procedures allow unions to be at uh, to be present or not okay that's the end of part two okay i'm going to part three these are very this is a very quick part investigators traits background and qualification what makes a good investigator there's sherlock holmes there trying to look for the mafia boss right at the bottom right hand corner of the slide you can see a guy holding a machine gun at the bottom there okay traits of a good investigator he or she must be curious and inquisitive he may, he ideally he or she 
is a subject matter expert on the on the subject he's invest he or she is investigating. It doesn't mean that uh, they cannot learn, but it's ideal. So, for example, if a, a, a failure happened on a particular aircraft type, maybe the investigator must be licensed on the aircraft type. Just, that's just an example. May or may not be, uh, be a requirement, but uh, it's good. So at least uh, he can pick up a lot of uh, pick up a lot of facts if he's expert on it. Rely on evidence and facts. No hearsay. A good investigator rely on evidence and facts. A good investiga investigator must be a good communicator. A good communicator doesn't mean that the person speaks well. Uh, a good communicator also means that he or she knows when to stop talking. Because more often than not, in the interview room, I have noticed that uh, in a two-hour session of interviews, 90% or 80%, I mean 90% is a bit of exaggeration, but most of the time, the investigator is talking and the witness is not talking at all. What we want is to collect information, information extraction. So we have to ask the question long enough, short enough, sharp enough, so that the witness talks. If the investigator, investigator keep on talking, you're not going to get any information from the witness. Then the investigator needs to be resourceful. If this particular area he can't go, he need to look for other areas to find the information. Uh, he got to be resourceful in his uh, information gathering. Able to make conclusions objectively and do not base conclusions on emotions. So in as an investigator, you need to be patient and you do not jump to conclusions. That is why uh, they always say that uh, a person, even a doctor, you cannot treat your patient, which is your relative, because you have your emotion on it. So you have to actually uh, disengage your emotions from your particular work and try to look for the facts that led to that particular event. Uh, the next point, know when to stop the investigation. There are some investigators are so inquisitive, they want to go, they want to know more and more and more, but they don't know when to stop. And when they know more and more, and it will lead them to a particular uh, area which is totally unrelated to the original intent. So this one comes back to the know your scope of investigation. Uh, then, of course, the last two points, ask probing questions. You must, have, you must ask the right questions. You do not ask questions which are, I won't say not, you do not ask questions which are close-ended. The questions must keep the witness talking. And of course, a good report writer. A good report writer is because you get all this information. All of us uh, can have a lot of questions, speaks well, but how do you translate whatever you have spoken into writing? That is a challenge. Okay, qualifications of a QA engineer or inspector. Okay, uh, ideally, but not a must, in most uh, organizations, they tend to take licensed aircraft engineers with type rating. Of course, uh, for UPM and uh, MySet, uh, the, the requirements to be a, uh, or the limitations for a licensed aircraft engineer is within the CA Malaysia Air Wilderness Notices. 1101. Uh, you can have a look at it in their website. Uh, those aspiring to be a licensed aircraft engineer. Uh, relevant aircraft maintenance experience, of course. Uh, I've seen um, organizations putting up minimum of five years maintenance requirement, seven years, sometimes even 10. So it's, uh, it's an asset if you have maintenance experience. Be patient, right mindset and attitude. Always look, uh, behave positive. No, never have that negative mindset. No, no, you already start accusing the, the individual before the investigation starts. Always give the benefit of the doubt to everybody else while investigating. Okay, of course, knowledge of local internal requirements and NEA regulations. You must know your regulations. Uh, next point, investigation and audit training. It is not a prerequisite to get into the, uh, to be a quality engineer but it's good to have. Uh, the department will train you once you get into, the, uh, into that position. Good communicator and outspoken. Good report writer. Okay, the last point, adapting to changes in the environment or trends. 
So, uh, as a quality engineer and an investigator, you must also uh, run with the trends. You cannot behave, uh, a quality engineer who behaves 30 years ago, that sort of uh, mindset, that sort of uh, techniques uh, cannot be applied to current current uh, environment or especially with the current generation of people. So, uh, especially experienced uh, investigator, he or she must uh, adapt to changes uh, in terms of, at least in terms of inter interviewing and uh, information collection because uh, trends have changed, uh, behaviors have changed. If you use old techniques, it's not going to really get you uh, anywhere in terms of uh, investigation. Now, of course, the last uh, caveat at the bottom there, qualifications vary from organization to organization. So, uh, some organizations may not even want a licensed aircraft engineer. They might just take an aerospace degree holder to be in a quality engineer. That's possible. So, you will vary. Okay. Thank you. Uh, that was my last slide. I got no more slides. Uh, I'll take questions uh, from now. Ramesh? Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chin. Uh, it's a very informative session we had today. Um, is there anybody who wants to ask question before I move on to the chat box? Okay, there are a few questions posted in the chat box, uh, China. Okay. okay. There is this uh, thing called, uh, uh, please elaborate on the practical aspect of the coordination between MNE and Flight Ops Division for investigation of accidents and incidents. Mm -hmm. What is the uh, coordination between uh, MNE for uh, investigations and accidents, MNE and Flight Ops? Okay. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, yeah, yeah. First of all, I I I do not know the abbreviation of M and E, but uh, to under to answer the question in general, if the incident or accident, uh, let's use the term major major, uh, and it involves other departments, so the quality department, uh, the head of quality, will normally be uh contacted or the quality head of quality will contact uh, the respective areas if if for example if the particular incident involves operations meaning that uh, if it's there is a flight crew involved cabin crew involved uh, the coordination uh, would be done with, uh, with the corporate safety departments if the organization organization has a corporate safety so we will take a backseat in terms of only advising on the technical issues technical meaning engineering related issues not so much of operational issues we cannot lead that, those sort of investigations because uh, chances are is an operational uh, operational uh, uh, investigation uh, in relation to uh, the flight crew So, okay, so, so we, we will take a back seat. Uh, we will approach it. Yeah. Okay, there's another question. Um, the relationship between surveillance and investigations mm -hmm. to safety, safety management system. Okay. What is the relationship between two of them? Is there any relationship or no? Okay. Uh, safety SMS, uh, basically, uh, it's a like like the term means safety it's a uh, it's a risk based uh risk based uh, assessment for for the organization there are certain uh, there's a, a matrix that you need to run whether uh, uh, which level of safety grades are you in so of course there is a relationship uh we, we have too many incidences and too many investigations that will affect your your grading within the sms so yes, there is a direct relationship. Uh, then, uh, then of course, this uh, there is a meeting, uh, the SMS meeting uh, between the accountable manager and of course uh, with the authorities to uh, to uh, to display all these uh, data of uh, incidents. Yes, there is a direct uh, correlation to SMS. 
Okay, there's another question posted in the chat box here. Mm -hmm. This is because regards to the investigation report. Mm -hmm. Often when we send the investigation report to the National Aviation Authority, okay. at the same time, there will be some kind of disagreement between a few parties before the finalization. Right? Okay. Uh, investigation recipients is a disagreement. Uh, before they submit to it, will there be any uh, form of uh, finalization before being distributed to the uh, to yes, the uh, uh, From my experience, when you complete the investigation, you will be vetted by your superiors. It's not only the investigator that's going to come up with a report per se. So it needs to be vetted by your superiors and your superiors need to approve it. So then after that, you'll be distributed. Uh, so from my experience so far, there is uh, investigation reports, disagreement. They are mainly due to how it was approached, not so much of the findings. If your findings are 100% uh, grounded on facts and references, then you're on very solid ground. The disagreement always comes in. Uh, maybe uh, the investigator has uh, was too harsh. He comes in, uh, comes in very aggressive, or he that is not the right approach. Uh, he went to the wrong department. So, so, so yes, there is a check and balance in terms of the final report. Uh, the superior needs to read and vet, and of course, uh, if there is any disagreement, then the superior will inform the uh, quality engineer first before it's dis distributed. Okay, between the investigator and the uh, head of department, right? I mean, before you send the send the uh, report to the boss, will there be before they submit to the National Aviation Authority or to the higher authority, mm -hmm. will there be any tempering of uh, this kind of report? Or uh, will, the, will the person who produce the report, the end of the day, he'll be notified this is your final report? Okay. A final report uh, is as final as it can be with the information at that point in time. Assuming that you have a final report now, and uh, one week later or one month later, there's new evidence that surfaces uh, in relation to the particular investigation. You can amend the report based on the new evidence under a revision. Let's say your first issue is uh, reference number revision zero. You go to revision one. So there's, you can trace the particular report if there's a revision to the report based on new evidence. You cannot just revise it uh, as you like or sukahati, you, you, you don't agree, you revise it. So there is traceability in the report. One. Two, uh, the, uh, the disagreement in terms of uh, the report writing, the, there is always a check and balance. In fact, uh, it's, it's distributed within certain parties. It's not available throughout all the staff in the organization. So up to a certain level, you get access to the report and you can read the report. So it, there is no question of tempering of the report uh, because if you temper, your conclusion is based on a particular fact. So how can you temper that? So I would say, uh, in general, the answer is no, there won't be any tempering because it's not a criminal case. Why would you do it? Okay, uh, not a question. Uh, uh, the participants, uh, anybody has got any question to ask? You are free to ask now. You can uh, unmute your mic and ask the question. Mr. Chin is ready to uh, answer your questions. Uh, T.S. Ramesh, uh, maybe I have one question here. Yes, please, uh, T.S. Ricky. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chin, for your good presentation. Uh, very excellent. Um, uh, uh, as a licensed aircraft engineer or a tech services engineer, aerospace engineer, yeah, uh, for them to transition into uh, to be a quality assurance engineer, uh, is it a very difficult uh, or a very difficult task for them to transit through transition from a licensed aircraft engineer or a tech services engineer, aerospace engineer, uh, to become a QB engineer? Is it a uh, is it a very challenging or, or how long did it take uh, you? Uh, okay, that's good. Yeah. Okay. Th uh, thank you, Ricky, for the question. It's a very good question. Um, uh, let, let's, let's put it straight out that uh, your, your minimum requirement for to be a quality engineer. 
in aviation part 145 or camel, it doesn't mean that you need to be a licensed aircraft engineer. You can be a degree holder in aerospace or, or aeronautical, uh, but it depends on the organization. Okay, so the key point here is that uh, whether it's difficult to transition or not, to me, it depends on the person, the character of the person. The main issue here is that as a quality engineer, you are an auditor, you are an uh, investigator, and you, and how should I say, enforce certain requirements. If you are a type of person that has likes to have a lot of friends, uh, likes to mingle around, talk, the nature of the job is that uh, you tend to lose a lot of friends because you need to find information from your colleagues uh, on the floor. So if you are uh, if you are outgoing person, like to have uh, many friends, many people around you, uh, and to talk to you may when you become a quality engineer, you may tend to lose many or such of your friends. So now it can be very lonely. So the transition is not so much of qualification and whatever I've presented. It's more whether can you take this so-called open, close inverted commas, loneliness in the organization. So uh, whomever aspires to be a quality engineer, a good quality engineer, you need to be prepared for this. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, just a touch on uh, Chin's, uh, Mr. Chin's point just now. What he said was actually, when we see a quality assurance uh, investigator, I mean, an uh, uh, engineer comes to um, uh, walk around or he just walk around the hangar or whatever, we are not sure whether he's just walking around or he's doing some investigation, you see, or he might just pick up something. They are something like an enforcement officer. So most of them feel that, you know, these people, enforcement officers are here to, here to catch them. <laughs> Am I right, Chin? Yes, yes. Uh, you, you, then you, you get this, uh, uh, this like a policeman sort of uh, mentality, but which we are not. We are just enforcing whatever that uh, has been laid down uh, by the requirements. So a lot of people think that we are there to talk to them, to look for information, try to spy on someone. Uh, even though by the very fact that that, that that quality engineer has gone just to have minimum te saja. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, breaking, Mr. Chin. Yeah, breaking, Chin. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Uh, uh, I've completed the, the answer to the question. Okay, there's another question posted in the chat box here. Mm -hmm. right, uh, some LE take up safety investigation course independently mm -hmm. by themselves. Okay. Does an LE stand, uh, does this person stand a better chance of joining quality uh, assurance department? Okay. Which is qualification? That question needs to be posed to the uh, the your that particular organization because I cannot answer for the uh, other organizations as I'm in fact I'm no more working in any of these organizations so you depend on the head of department of the quality for that organization whether you meet their minimum requirement or not so it's a good uh, training to have safety investigation it's good but it's not a prerequisite to be going into quality. It's not mandatory, I would say. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, any more questions from the participants? The floor is open for your last questions. Uh, probably uh, I, I, I asked one question that yes, from here. Yeah? Okay. Uh, yes, please. Uh, <clears throat> usually, <laughs> the, uh, what you call it? You're grilling me, man. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm just curious, uh, thinking about this, yeah. Uh, uh, will the quality assurance engineer himself, yeah, uh, subject to uh, investigation? Uh, uh, is there any cases that happen like this before, maybe because of his uh, failure or, or he's unable to interpret certain things that happened on an incident and, and resulted in an in a, in a inaccurate report? In, in, if that is the case, will the QAE himself subject to an uh, investigation? And that's my question. Thanks. Oh, okay. Uh, through my experience, uh, I have not experienced uh, the quality engineer itself uh, being disciplined that way. Uh, but uh, any organization would have their check and balance even for quality. Uh, I think a lot of people do not know, even the quality department is being audited. 
not by the regulators, but internally within uh, another department. Uh, uh, there are scheduled audits. Uh, for for example, maybe uh, corporate safety. For example, I'm I'm not, I'm not saying it's corporate safety, but corporate safety comes to audit the quality department. So there is check and balance. One, two is that internally within the quality department, like all other departments, we they have uh, HR procedures to uh, ascertain uh, technical feasibility and uh, behavior of the staff. So it will fall within the HR scope, let's say, if the particular uh, staff, quality staff, is not uh, behaving appropriately or not technically sound. So there you, you can apply that HR scope within that particular uh, aspect. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, there's one question in the chat box which I uh, missed out just now. Okay. Can the Camo and Maintenance mm -hmm. Workshop be the same organization? I think he's talking about the QA. QA? Yeah, uh, can the Camo Quality Maintenance Workshop can be the same organization? Okay, I will, I will not elaborate on this further, but yes, it can be. But of course, there are caveats to it. Short answer, yes. But there are, of course, caveats to it. Okay, uh, any participants? Okay, uh, uh, we are we are we are here for questions Q and A time. So, if there's no questions asked, okay, I would like to thank uh, uh, Mr. Chin. Uh, for his uh, wonderful presentation okay. today, uh, the participants around forty participants uh, really benefited, including me, on your explanation on the uh, the quality assurance. And I would take this opportunity to uh, congratulate and thanks uh, Prof. IRTS Dr. Abdurrahim bin Abu Talib, the head of department of uh, Aerospace Engineering University, Putra, Malaysia for organizing this uh, beautiful uh, this beautiful webinar for us today uh, prof uh, congratulations for you being uh, promoted as a prof thank you very much and uh, uh, thank you uh, congratulations uh, prof <laughs> thank you thank you okay and um, to move on further uh, for the rest of the participants i uh, would like to encourage you all to join my set uh, MySet is an uh, organization where they have the uh, we have aerospace and aviation professional in in, uh, in, in that group. Uh, basically, uh, Tias Ricky, myself, and a few more others are also members of MySet. And uh, check out their website. Uh, we will be having the AGM next month, so hopefully more of the participants will join MySet to be uh, to be on the professional side, right? If uh, nothing much, um, uh, Prof, you have anything to say, Prof? Okay, okay thank you, T.S. Ramesh, for this uh, uh, moderating this session. Uh, this is a quite uh, a fruitful session, uh, especially for me. There are participants uh, all the way from Polytechnic Medan, uh, my friend from Polytechnic Medan. There are also uh, uh, students, uh, my PhD student way back from Iraq. He's uh, already there. And um, I believe there are, it is international, it's not just Malaysian, there are people, other people benefit this uh, session as well. And uh, just to uh, highlight to the participants, uh, this particular video uh, will be uh, uh, compiled as well. We will put it in the YouTube channel and uh, probably you can share it with your friends and, and other people. On behalf of uh, my set as well as University of Putra Malaysia, I would like to officially thank Mr. Chin for his uh, experience sharing just now. Um, at the same time, uh, to T.S. Ramesh for moderating this particular session. So we welcome all of you to join my set uh, as well as uh, probably there are a lot of experienced people inside this uh, uh, webinar uh, to share their thoughts and uh, sh um, their views on uh, so that we can benefit it uh, together. So thank you. I pass back to Ramesh. Okay.
Okay. Um, uh, uh, thank you, Prof. Uh, thank you for your words. Uh, Prof, uh, the other thing, uh, can I just know when is the Mindset AGM next month so you can tell everybody when it's the Mindset so they can come to the AGM and join, become the Mindset member? Okay. Uh, th thank you, Ramesh. Um, yesterday, our council meeting already decided that the um, AGM this year will be on the uh, second week of August. So, it's going to be on Saturday. It's going to be held uh, in uh, Bangi Resort Hotel. Uh, so, it, it, the the official date will be announced um, and uh, all members uh, are invited to come. It is free of charge. For new members, of course, you need to become a member and uh, you can you can join us. Uh, so, we will announce the, the official uh, date as well as venue. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Prof. Uh, if uh, if uh, nothing for everybody, thank you all for spending your fruitful Saturday morning with us. Uh, with this, I would like to conclude the webinar series number five, jointly organized by UPM and my mindset. It's close. Thank you all very much. Have a nice weekend. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chin, again. Thanks, Prof. And uh, UPM and my set team. And thanks to, to TS Wiki also for getting the speaker today. Thank you all. Have a nice weekend.